Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and we're back with another video on NDI, which is an awesome protocol that allows you to go into applications like uh, OBS here and just pull in video sources over the network like a capture card. So for example, we're just going to hit OK here, and now I've got a video source from the other side of my house uh, that's just going over my local network and it's very versatile it works great and in many cases you can bring in four or five sources over a single ethernet connection for your live or recorded broadcast it's a big game changer i use it all the time here in the studio and a lot of other folks especially those on college and high school campuses are making great use of this technology and today we're taking a look at another ndi device this is called the bird dog and this is kind of similar to the Connect Spark that we looked at a few months ago. And what it lets you do is plug in any HDMI source and make it available over your network in just the same way you saw that uh, video source going into my OBS session here a second ago. But this device works a little bit differently than the Spark in that it's pushing the video over at a higher bit rate, so you're less likely to see compression artifacts. So we'll take a look and see what differentiates the bird dog here from the spark in this video and give you a good feel for what it can and can't do. And we'll do that in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that I paid for this device with my own funds. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this bird dog is all about. So let's take a closer look now at the hardware. This is a piece of professional video gear and as such commands a professional price. It costs $595, which is $100 more than uh, what you might spend on the new tech Spark device. But this is professional video gear and these devices do tend to cost a bit more, but they generally work pretty reliably. Uh, this is also camera mountable like the Spark can be. They sell an optional mounting bracket for that. However, unlike the Spark, this does not have any Wi-Fi capability. It is strictly Ethernet. It's got a gigabit Ethernet adapter there on the back. Uh, one of the cool things with the Spark is that because it compresses the video, you can actually work with fairly low bandwidth, but get pretty decent video quality out of it. In fact, my local high school has a bunch of these and they use them uh, for covering sporting events because they just need a somewhat decent Wi-Fi signal to get everything going. Uh, this one's probably going to be a little more locked down because it is a wired only device. Like the Spark, it's got two HDMI uh, plugs on the back here. One is for the input, the other is a loop out. Uh, so what you can do with this is have a monitor connected to it so you can see exactly what the bird dog is working with. Uh, but one of the cool things about the bird dog that you can't do on the Spark is that you can use it as an NDI client. So if you have a video monitor on the other end of your studio or someplace where you're trying to get your program out, for example, to appear, uh, you can use this box and actually just plug a monitor into it and have it just work like an NDI client would. It's pretty flexible like that. It is one mode or the other. It can't work as a client and a uh, input device, but it's nice to have that capability. And I was actually using it uh, as a client the other day for a project I was working on. Uh, the other thing that it's got here is an audio jack. Now this is not for audio input. This is something that the uh, Spark has, but it uses this jack for communications and they're coming out with a comm system that will work with all of their NDI devices. And you can plug a headset into this port here and communicate with your camera operators with it all through the single network connection. It's very flexible and it's something that's going to be unique to the bird dog products. I think they're going to charge another 500 bucks for the software that does this, but what it'll do is give you on your tablet a view of what all the cameras are seeing. You can then push a, a button on screen and communicate with camera operators without having to have additional radios, and that might be useful for some folks there. Uh, there are some tally lights here on the front that I'll show you in a minute, and that is pretty much it. It is a very simple device, but what's really neat about this is that you can power it with uh, DC power here. So if you look on the side, the uh, input is 5 to 18 volts, but it's also capable of working with power over Ethernet. So I've got a PoE uh, injector off, off camera here. I can just plug in this Ethernet cable, and with a single cable, 
I can power the device, but also get it to deliver video. This is all I need is just this Ethernet cable. And this can certainly be something useful out in the field. If you don't really want to run power everywhere, you just have to bring your Ethernet out and you are good to go. Uh, but there are some things the Spark can do that the Bird Dog can't. So we already talked about the Wi-Fi. As I mentioned also, the Spark has analog audio inputs and outputs on it. Uh, the Bird Dog can only get its audio over the HDMI connection. The Spark also has a USB connector here on the front so that you can connect to it if you're having trouble connecting to it over the network. It's a nice fail safe. If you have to configure when you're out in the field and you have some kind of network glitch, that's a helpful feature there. Another thing the Spark does that the Bird Dog doesn't is record video. You can put a micro SD card in there or connect up multiple USB flash drives and whatever the Spark sees, it records even if you have a network issue while you're running around in the field with it. So that's a nice fail safe if for some reason your live production loses connectivity, your edit later can reincorporate the footage that was getting captured out there. And one last thing the Spark can do is that it has a built-in scaler, so you can actually zoom in uh, to the video and kind of treat it like a virtual PTZ camera. That feature is not on the Bird Dog. So now that we've differentiated these things a bit, let's take a look and see what the Bird Dog can do. So here is an image from my PC that's running over HDMI to the Bird Dog, and the Bird Dog, of course, is pushing this out via IP to my TriCaster. Uh, this video is running at 1080p at 60 frames per second, but my TriCaster is currently recording at 30, so I'll put in some video on my Extras channel where you can see the full 1080p 60 video. But it's nice and crisp and clear here. I'm not seeing a lot of the compression artifacts that we typically see on the Spark with these kinds of game capture, and I'll put up a little bit more footage in a few minutes to give you a better comparison. The maximum resolution of the Bird Dog is 60 frames per second at 1080p. It does not do 4K. Uh, NewTek has another version of their Spark that does support 4K video now. That costs about $1,000 or so. So there are 4K NDI options out there, but again, the max on this one is 1080p 60, but it does support a number of resolutions below that and uh, lower frame rates too. It supports most of what you would uh, get out of most broadcast cameras and other types of cameras that you might be using. So altogether, very good image quality here as you can see. Let's take a look now and see what the network and CPU utilization is on the Bird Dog versus the Spark, and then we'll get into some more image comparisons. All right, so let's jump over to my Windows computer now and see what kind of network usage we're getting out of this. And right now, it's kind of variable. We'll see it go down as low as like 9 or 10 megabits per second for this high motion scene here. This is 1080p at 60 frames per second. But then sometimes it'll jump up higher to like 22 or so. Uh, so it is doing some compression. All NDI does have some compression built in. But again, it's a different kind of compression versus what the uh, Spark would typically do. Now on this i7 computer, it's using about uh, 7 or 8% of the CPU to process this. It is uh, taking advantage of the hardware acceleration we have available to us on this particular Dell laptop, so uh, you will see that kind of usage. Let's sw uh, shift over to the Spark now, and this is running with the same exact demo, and let's see what kind of network usage we get out of the Spark. So we'll let that uh, connect up there, and now with the Spark, you can see our network usage here is about uh, 8 to 9 megabits per second. I believe we can get as high as 15 on the setting that I'm at right now, but you can see the uh, network usage is significantly less, but the CPU usage is a little bit higher because the Spark is sending over a more compressed image to the computer to process. So if you are looking to squeeze as much bandwidth as you can, the Spark is definitely the way to go. Uh, but that will come at a bit of a CPU cost. Not a significant one, but certainly will uh, require a little bit more CPU usage. Now, the computer we're testing this with is an i7 Dell. It's a quad-core Broadwell chip from a few years back. So this should hopefully give you some ideas to what kind of CPU usage you can expect uh, from the bird dog. Now, I want to move next over to image quality because there are some areas where you'll certainly notice a difference between the two. Uh, we're going to continue on with our computer gaming example here for a minute because uh, this is probably the best way to pull out some of the compression artifacts that you might see uh, with the Spark. So we're going to look at a game called Doom because this was something that I covered in my review of the Spark. 
And as you can see here with the spark footage that is rolling, we did see a lot of noticeable compression artifacts with that footage coming over. Uh, 1080p here at 60 frames per second. But if we cut over now to the bird dog, you can see the image is a lot cleaner. There's less of those compression artifacts going on, and it might work a little better if you're doing eSports or some other kind of game capturing in the course of your production. Here's a side-by-side -side so you can see what it looks like next to each other. Uh, the, uh, the bird dog is on the left and the spark is on the right. So I think for things like computer capture, you're probably going to be doing a little better with the bird dog. One of the reasons why I bought the bird dog is that I'm often capturing things off my phone. And I was noticing some weird compression stuff happening from time to time that I was trying to mitigate. And hopefully the bird dog will do that. Certainly in my initial testing, it looks like it is doing a little bit better with that kind of stuff. So let's move on now to some video. And I'm going to show you right now the original video that we were using for this test. We're now going to shift over to the image from the Spark, and you can see that it does have some compression artifacts popping up in the sky as we're moving the camera around. Nothing significant. In fact, when I use the Spark uh, for some of the things that I do here on the channel, I rarely notice the compression issues while I'm doing my productions, and I don't think any of my viewers have noticed anything given that we're usually putting it out on a live stream or on YouTube where there's additional compression going on. Uh, but the bird dog does look a little bit better. The images are a little bit sharper. I'm also noticing that there is, though, some compression artifacting going on in the sky, but it looks a little different. It's more like a grid-like pattern versus some of the blockiness that we saw with the spark. But generally, I think for most uses, it's kind of a push here. So the bottom line is that the bird dog will have better images, but uh, there is a convenience factor with the spark here that might mitigate the image quality differences here, especially when viewers may not notice the difference. If you can send somebody down on the court with one of these powered by a battery and Wi-Fi, they may forgive a little bit of compression artifacts to get the story and get a little bit closer to the action. So again, it's really going to matter based on what your individual needs are. But I think if you're sitting in a studio like I am, the bird dog might have the edge here, especially because it will deliver a slightly better image. Now in my Spark review, we noted that the latency was very low on it despite the compression. Uh, the bird dog here, as you can see, seems to be working pretty well too. Uh, this camera is plugged in via HDMI to the bird dog, but my audio is going through my TriCaster right now, and it looks like everything is matching up pretty decently here. I'm not seeing a huge difference between the time that I clap my hands and you hear it. So overall, I think this will be a very low latency experience as most NDI devices are. So let's take a quick look at the control panel for the bird dog. It is a simple device, so the controls here are pretty simple too. Uh, on the front screen here, you've got all the information you might need, including what video mode it's currently set at. So you can see we're at 30 frames per second, 1080p, along with the color space. It is active and on the network. Uh, you've got your firmware version here. If you need to restart the video, you can just click that to refresh that. You can also reboot the device here with a mouse click. Over on the network settings, you can see right now we're set to DHCP. Uh, you can also set a static fallback address so that if for some reason it does not get an IP out in the field, you'll know what its IP address is. Uh, what the Spark does again is that it has that USB interface, but it looks like if you do have network trouble, you should be able to find your way back to the bird dog. You can also set a little local DNS for it so you could connect uh, just by typing this address in. Uh, to your web browser to find it, so that's helpful. Now the video menu gives you a few other options here too, so you have the ability to mute the audio. You also have the tally control here, so right now I have tally set to on, and let's pull up the bird dog here. I'm going to have our video image here get pulled up in preview, and as you can see it is currently lit up green to indicate that we might be next here, and then if we take the shot, and I'll say hello everybody, uh, you'll see now that the tally lights, yep, are, are lighting up red so you know that you're on camera. Uh, that's something, by the way, that the uh, Spark here will also do. It's got some lights up here that will give you some tally indications, so that could be helpful when you're out in the field. Now, you also have some helpful video input settings. So right now, I've got the input selection set to manual, but there's only one input on this device, HDMI, so that setting is not always that useful. But there's another configuration that becomes available to you when you do set the input selection manually. So you can see when we do auto, all this other stuff goes away. 
And if we go over to manual, you can actually force the device into a specific resolution because if you've got a camera that keeps going into the wrong resolution or frame rate when you plug it in because it's not being detected automatically properly, you can just tell the bird dog to always operate at X resolution and frame rate and that might solve some problems for you. So I've typically left mine here on auto, but I occasionally encounter computers that just don't get it right and this is a way that you can avoid having some mix up with the automatic detection not working properly. So I thought uh, that was certainly a helpful thing there. Uh, in the configuration mode here, you can change its operation from encoding to decoding. And we're going to do that in a second here, where you can use it as an NDI client. And then over here on system, you can change the password, change the name of the device, set the LED brightness on the front, and of course, do your firmware updates and whatnot there. So let's go back now to configure, and let's get this thing working as an NDI client. So we've got the bird dog now operating in decode mode. And you can see we have a TriCaster here on our current source. And this is the first input from my TriCaster. And if we switch over to my desk, you can see uh, my monitor here going with my image on screen. And if we go back to the control panel here and select our second TriCaster input here in two and hit apply, uh, what should happen here is a relatively quick uh, switch over from one source to the other. I found this is an area where sometimes you might need to do a device reset. Sometimes it works, sometimes it just kind of freezes up here on screen like it's doing right now. Sometimes you got to click apply again to really kind of push it into getting itself to go and there we go. Uh, you can fairly easily switch back and forth here to uh, get this stuff working and it can work very well as a way to get a high quality video output from your TriCaster or another NDI device. However, what I've discovered with this is that it doesn't support the NDI HX protocol, which is the compression that the uh, Spark over there uses. So unfortunately, my Spark doesn't work with this. I have a PTZ optics camera that also uses NDI HX. That doesn't work with this either. It's only going to work with the regular NDI protocol. However, you should be able to find devices that work with it. And for example, the um, the NDI scan converter that works on computers works here as well, so I can apply that here and hopefully our uh, crazy frozen image here will switch over to the computer desktop here in a second using the scan converter software on my Windows PC. By the way, if you are looking for more information on NDI, the video that I did on it a few weeks ago, you'll be able to see how all of this works in action and what software you need. But here you go. You can see my computer is up here now uh, transmitting its image over the network via NDI. Very cool stuff. So that's going to do it for this look at the bird dog. I think this device is very well suited for studio environments where you want something relatively inexpensive, but want the best possible image quality. Uh, this one certainly delivers the image quality, although it doesn't have the same conveniences that you'll get uh, with the Spark, which can of course work over Wi-Fi and therefore might provide a lot more flexibility for field productions. But for me, I think this is going to work well for uh, what I intend to use it for, which is basically a means of capturing screen images and occasionally hooking up a camera here and there. And then of course the Spark that I have will be useful for other things that I do where I need a little bit more flexibility in where I place the camera because again, I can use Wi-Fi to bring uh, those images over to my TriCaster. So I'm pretty pleased with this. I'm going to uh, keep working with it and I'll let you know if anything else pops up that I find interesting. We'll see what kind of firmware updates they provide for it and what things they add to it over time. But overall, I think they've put together a nice simple product here that is a good alternative to the Spark if you were not happy with the Spark's image quality. Until next time, this is Lon Sybin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more.
And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.